Hello and welcome to another Office Hours Capsule. That's right, Capsule. This is a small section of the Office Hours stream where we talk about Star Citizen news and updates and theory crafting and other stuff like that. Uh, but join us live on th uh, Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern at our Office Hours live stream, usually on Twitch and on YouTube. This week was a little wonky because Something wasn't working for the, the dual stream, so I just did it on YouTube, or just did it on Twitch. But um, the full YouTube, uh, the full stream will be up on YouTube after the fact. This is a little tiny section of that, so you have an idea of what we've talked about, uh, and for your own convenience, but to come join us live on, on uh, stream to ask questions and discuss what we've, we've talked about. But I've always, uh, I've also been doing these monthly reports uh, for quite a while now because people have asked me to read them out. Well, I, I started reading them out on stream and people asked me to turn them into videos so that people could watch them later. So uh, as always, please let me know in the comments below if this is helpful for you. If you're actually listening to this, that helps me out a lot to know that I am in fact still doing this because if people don't want me to do it, I won't do it. <laughs> I enjoy it, but as always, it's important to gauge your reaction as well. And if you did enjoy this and you are interested in hearing all about the monthly reports from Star Citizen and Squadron 42 every month, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit the little bell icon for more uh, to keep updated on all of these when they exactly drop. And uh, before I get started, I do want to mention this is not a summary. Kind of obvious by the length, but this is not a summary. Not that summaries are bad, but that summaries in general are unreliable because you're listening to someone else's interpretation of the information, which is fine, but they'll often leave out information that may be vital to you or might be interesting, but never gets said because it's their own interpretation. So this is me reading through the entire thing, adding a little bit of my own context and my own questions or my own interpretation, but reading the whole thing for you. So you get the entire context of what's being said. So. If you really, really want the full context, I suggest watching it. You're watching this video, but reading it yourself. The link will be in the description for you to read it after the fact. With that all being said, let's start with the September monthly report for Squadron 42. All right. So, Squadron 42 monthly report, September 2022. AI content. Throughout September, AI content team continued to work on the vendor and patron behaviors that will allow AI characters to serve, carry, and consume food and drink. This complex set of behaviors is progressing well and will add impressive fidelity to several areas of the game. They also got the new medical behavior working on the Idris. Okay, that's interesting. New medical behavior, as well as uh, serve, carry, and consume food. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, alongside behaviors, progress was made on two important usables. The first being used in opening crates, inspecting the contents and lifting items in and out. The second is for tactile chair, uh, for a tactile chair that allows AI characters to get in and out by rotating with, with their hands. Okay. Is, is that supposed to be tactical chair? Think of like a office chair maybe? I don't know. They also presented the first new ver the, the first version of the, a simulated bed sheet that allows NPCs to sleep under a blanket. Call Kotaku. They're talking about bed sheets again. Everyone seems really pleased with the results, so we can hope to build on this foundation. Many thanks to the tech animation team for their support with this. AI content. Progress was made with the Quartermaster 2, which involved new mocap, updating poses, polishing animations, and prototyping dynamic conversations. AI features. AI features. Last month, the AI features team continued to develop the traits that will allow specialized specialization of NPC behaviors in specific levels and scenarios. This included implementing the sentry trait, which forces players to use defensive tactics, characters to use defensive tactics and never leave cover unless compromised. 
This will be particularly useful for NPCs equipped with sniper rifles and rocket launchers. The reckless trait, which will be the opposite, forcing character to adopt more aggressive tactics and never use cover options. This will be utilized by close combat berserker enemy types. There are also aggressive and cautious traits that adopt varying weights of cover use. So, if you watched CitizenCon, that is an additional add-on to that system. You saw pushers, defenders, and strafers. These are additional traits that will be added to those already individual traits. So every AI can have multiple traits system, multiple traits attached to their character. They're not just one note machines, um, which will get, have their behavior act slightly differently. It's not revolutionary tech, the tech's, that kind of tech's been around for a while, but it, for Star Citizen, it's a very flexible and interesting system because it'll work, work for Squadron 42 and Star Citizen at the same time. So, so make sure you check those, uh, that, that, those videos out for that. I'll have a video talking about some of those um, separately. I've done one for the, for, the, for the stream here, but I'll be doing a separate video specifically talking about those sections and what they mean for the game. Uh, a little bit later, but it won't be two hours. It'll be much shorter than Chris Robertson and Richard talking. Uh, all right. They also implemented usables that allow for context-specific search animations to be played around certain level features. For example, vents over railings and around crates. This adds life to NPC investigations that give them more opportunity to use the environment to search along with increasing tension for hunted players. AI features also implemented several new features for combat with the Van Duel, including gameplay for when the player is in close combat and knocked down. Players will now have a limited window to move out of the way before a synchronized execution animation is played. We're returning to uh, Star Souls. <laughs> Soul, not Soul Citizen. Yeah, Star Souls, uh, which is something that I've been joking about for a long time. Uh, and obviously, Chris has mentioned it multiple times he's a big fan of From Software games, so I wouldn't be surprised if you saw some brutal melee behavior from the Van Duel, which is fairly similar to Souls-like games. Uh, right. This really sells the Van Duel as a serious threat, where split-second decision-making is important to win the fight against the powerful and aggressive foe. If the player successfully dodges the Van Duel attack, it gives a short breathing period during which player can mount a counter-offensive. Combat rolls! <laughs> Combat rolling around the map. Uh, perception work continued, with the team supporting stealth gameplay loop by allowing the player to wear specific clothing to disguise themselves in different environments. The designers can configure which clothing works, for each faction and uh, location so that successful disguise combines both player actions and the configuration of the NPCs in the environment. The perception meter for detecting the player as a foe is then influenced by this parameter, giving a player more time to sneak into areas, especially when at a distance from enemies. To support the scaling of perception ranges and times, new wild lines were integrated to signal this new gameplay. For example, a suspicious enemy will challenge the player if their disguise or behavior isn't convincing. On the animation side, AI features progress with human-female combat animations. They also continued blocking out specific Van Duel animations, including the execution animations mentioned above. All right, AI tech. AI tech. AI tech. Last month, AI tech extended the functionality of navigation links, which involve fishing their work on finishing their work on a ladder extenders. Now NPCs are able to use and traverse ladders in a similar way to players. They also extended navigation links for doors to allow NPCs to use the entire width of doors, used for, for wider, wider doors or gaps in general, and enabled collision avoidance while traversing. They extended the way the NPCs interact with closed doors too. The aim was to have AI correctly understand which uh, door panels should be interacted with during traversal. To achieve this, the routing functionality inside the usable system was improved to use entity links. Uh, for locomotion, they worked on reducing foot sliding and leg phase blending. 
This involved reducing foot sliding during stop animations by matching the leg's phase, adding support for selecting the best animation option based on the leg phase, and extending the system to implement the uh, use of sharp turns for walking. On the internal subsumption editor, the team addressed usability feedback from the designers and bug fixing continued. They also began extending the tool to manage the editing of master graphs, which has never been possible in the external tool. Work has also, was also done to extend two different areas of AI perception functionality. The first not only allows NPCs inside ship cockpits to target on foot enemies not visible on radar, but also allows NPCs on the ground to visually track large objects such as vehicles and engage in ground to flight combat. So AI is now able to AI is now able to uh, track you on the ground, shoot at you from from ships, and also on the ground shoot at you if you're flying a ship or in a vehicle. The second is audio perception. Previously, NPCs could hear any sound if they're at the right distance from it. Now, the hearing component and audio map use uh, use the volume of the sound at its source and then calculate the strength of the audio received by the listener. This is used inside the perception component to influence the perception meter based on how strongly the sound is perceived. The new extension allows for the designers to create multiple curves to describe the influence of different audio semantics. For example, explosions have a different influence than footsteps. Each audio stimulus also has a different maximum value it can push the perception meter to. Finally, for AI tech, the idle system was extended to allow designers to set up different weights in the idle sets available to different usables. This allows them to better customize which idle sets should be pre uh, prevalent during the selection based on the environment they're creating. So, a lot of different changes to how AI are perceived the universe and how they can target players and various like differential modes. Um, this is all copy pasted. All this stuff is copy pasted from the Star Citizen uh, monthly report as well. Uh, but as we saw with CitizenCon, this stuff is primarily focused in Squadron, right? Which is why you'll see it mostly here. AI vehicles. Vehicle AI and vehicle features work together on AI targeting things other than vehicles, such as turrets, components, and stations. This, combined with special behaviors for strafing runs, allows the AI to perform attack runs on stations. They also worked on a system uh, AI for Chapter 1, uh, which involves a large number of AI attacking capital ships in coordinated waves. This result uh, required various improvements and fixes, with the team improving the system that allows NPCs to pick splines and fly along during attack runs. Animation. Animation-wise, animation worked on the ladder locomotion for both players and AI, including dodging. They continued to work on EVA and Zero-G, improving the feel and functionality. Gadgets were further developed too, including the deployable shield and Gals Galson weapons, which is includes the uh, melee weapons for Galsons. For AI, progress was made on the Vandal-related gameplay, with the current focus on stealth gameplay sections and enemy executions of the player. Interactions with non-sliding chairs, crates, rummaging, vendors, vending machines, data pads, and other life behavior sets progressed too. Development for the female spec ops continued with the female combatants close to implementation. For facial animation, the team continued to work on scene-specific animations with named cast characters. Mocap and onset facial services were also provided to the narrative team as they continued to flesh out the combat and story needs of the campaign. All right, very good. So getting a lot more, um, I don't know if that AI, the Vandal stuff is also interactions with non-sliding chairs, crates, rummaging, vendors, vending machines, data pads, and other life behavior. I don't know if that, that also was, was Vandal related or just in individual, but plus all the obviously female specs ops is not mentioned, is not mentioned for Vandal. So lots of, lots of animation stuff for AI and some player stuff. All right. I am not a tech priest. I do not hear the whispers of the machine spirits. I am not a Starfleet engineer. I do not know 
how to turn rocks into replicators. I am not a, a forerunner engineer. I cannot disassemble and reassemble a vehicle out of rote memory because I was genetically programmed to do so. I am but a teacher and a content creator on the internet. I am not a, a programmer, an engine programmer at all, <laughs> uh, and barely do have any programming experience of my own. So when it comes to the engine, most of this is going to be Greek to me. It's going to be completely unrecognizable. So if you do understand things, and I'm looking at you, Ghost, if you do understand what's being, what's going on and what's being said, please do interpret what is being said. Read the tea leaves to figure out what is important from this and what isn't, because I don't know. That being said, let's read the engine. Engine. In September, the raw physics... Okay, I don't know why it's said the raw, because it's the RWI there. In September, the physics team refactored the Ray World Interaction, Intersection, RWI, verification. Requests are now verified when Q, the RWI API, now also supports the name parameter idiom to prevent further mishaps in its use. An option was added to RWI that allows sphere tracing against distance fields. <clears throat> Moreover, changes were done in the level export code to enable the reliable attachment of roped to other entities on the client. Okay. On the renderer, more progress was made in the Gen 12 transition. I get some of those words. Cube map backdrops, light beams, geom caches, silhouette rendering, water volumes, water reflections, and water caustics were ported. Various editor tools now run with Gen 12 as well, such as the character editor and mannequin. That's good. It's good. So a lot of stuff is being run on Gen 12. It sounds like most stuff is being run on Gen 12. Last month's support for transient graphics passes saw further adaption uptake with lots more passes now using it. Furthermore, support for transient compute and copy clear passes was added and work was, uh, to support transient scene render passes was currently underway. Additionally, memory tracking for graphics passes was added. Gen 12 now also supports re uh, texture um, anisotropy, an anisotropy, 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 anisotropy. 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 I think that's what it is. I can't even spell it. Uh, supports texture anisotropy overrides, as well as the global MP, uh, MIP bias. Material resources binding was refactored, and the alpha blending support was added to the hologram shader. Lastly, various optimize, optimizations were done to avoid redundant clears on render targets and updates on pass resources. The Gen 12 port of volumetric cloud rendering was completed. On the core engine, the team added support for syscalls in CIG profile and frame time is now included in peak detection CIG trace events. More work was being done to enable P4K files to be memory mappable, which will allow for faster engine startup. As an optimization, the team was able to remove entity-based networks network wakeups. So, we have a Gen 12 stuff, effectively, is what we're seeing. All right, features, gameplay. Squadron 42 feature team continued with tasks for the armory, enabling weapons to be delivered to different locations. It now also has its own set of first select animations when the player interacts with a weapon for the first time. For the crane feature, okay. Devs used inverse kinematics to link players' hands and joysticks so they animate together. Did they say crane? Cranes confirmed? Good to know. They also added a functionality for design such as snapping and locking. Uh, popping and locking now, okay. <laughs> Further progress was made on the new Mubba Glass with the team finishing the personal message app and implementing the first part of Mission Manager app to show mission briefings. Which we saw in Squadron 42. The uh, our show Susan Scott. Gameplay story. 
Last month, Gameplay Story held a mocap shoot that captured a variety of data for several late game scenes. Once processed, this data will allow the scenes to function well in game. A new scene was also created by reusing existing wild lines, which will allow the player to speak into uh, to a medic and be healed by them if required. Okay. Finally, the gameplay story exploration was done on the mess hall scene, uh, mess hall scenes to make them functional with AI animations so that all characters enter and leave smoothly. In September, okay, graphics and VFX programming. In September, the graphics team completed work on edge highlight rendering code in support of FPS scanning of occluded objects, which is what we saw in, in uh, Sitcom. This involved creating a new render to texture layer used exclusively for augmented reality rendering, which will be used for all AR slash in-world UI rendering going forward. The shader used for AR rendering was also upgraded to support testalization slash smoothing, triplanar uh, texture mas mapping, and dynamic multi-scale uh, texturing. Got some of that. At the request of the UI team, the graphics team investigated the possibility of using D3D vo slash Vulcan's anti-aliased line rendering for rendering, rendering for rendering wireframes on UI meshes. However, they decided to go with a shader-based approach using Teslaization hardware instead due to performance issues in the drivers. The team also began looking to improve, um, improving unifying all resource stream systems with the goal of simplifying code that allows allowing more intelligent use of available memory so they can adapt the different sc uh, scenarios across the game. Work on the ultra high resolution screenshot output was completed for the marketing team also. Need that for uh, for players, CIG. <laughs> Need that for players, especially for Squadron. Level design. Last month, the flight team progressed towards getting a large part of the game fully playable with functioning systems and mechanics, with a focus on a seam seamless experience. Following on from previous month's reports, September saw an expanded work on, on this beyond the first third of the game. So uh, the flight team and the FPS team, and the social team, have been, uh, uh, have been working on this. They're basically on a point where they want to be able to play the game fully playable, all of the things work from beginning to end for all of the game. Not necessarily done with finished assets, but having everything achievable, meaning you can do all of the missions, you can do all of the objectives in the mission, all of the missions objectives will spawn properly, all of that sort of thing. So you can play the game even in a jank state from beginning to end in a completionist way rather than just playing it with a bunch of placeholder assets and like white boxes and replace me balls and stuff, which they've been able to do for a while. Um, so it looks better and feels better so they can get a start, start getting a handle on is the game fun? Because a lot of people don't realize that games are made after they're built, <laughs> which sounds weird, but you can sit there and build a game and then sit down and try to play it. And it's not fun at all. So you have to go back and work, rework it and that kind of stuff. That's usually what beta is for once you get all the systems in place. So that is uh, what they're trying to get to. They're pushing, that's, that's, we can interpret that as they're pushing towards beta because they want to get all of those systems ready so they can start testing it for play testing as a full game rather than individual experiences in like missions. All right. Social team focused on several chapters, including the ongoing scene work on the Idris and Stanton inter interstitials. Uh, involved, this involved implementation, addressing feedback, and handshaking NPCs from scenes into behaviors. They also started to shift assignments for the Idris 80-person crew, including deck crew, bridge crew, engineers, and off-duty personnel. They also kicked off tasks for some cross-discipline chapters, including FPS, Flight, and Social. Level Design made good progress on social-related content, with a majority of their assigned scenes being ready for implementation. 
It's always essential to see the scene playing out in situ so we can review and assess what additional work could be required, level design team. So yeah, basically what they're doing is, is this, does it make sense? Is it fun? And does it flow well? Because a lot of people, and I'm just gonna do this in the office section. A lot of people don't realize that at its core, there are more, oh, I'll put this way. There are more games that have been built that have never released than released games because of that nature. You can spend years working on something and realizing it's just not fun. That's what happened with Titan, the, um, the MMO that was supposed to replace World of Warcraft, which eventually became Overwatch and Overwatch 2. That was completely scrapped because it just wasn't fun. Even they spent hours and hours of, uh, of work into it. It just didn't work well. So they scrapped it. Uh, that's what they're doing right now. They're trying to push to a point where they can determine if it's fun and what they need to do to change it to make it fun and also to make it flow well so that the you don't feel like there's weird hang-ups in the story. The story seems to be diverting into places it doesn't need to go to, that sort of thing. So everything needs to be tight, well thought out, well uh, have have implement like have a uh, what's it called have logical narration have, have all all sorts of things it's got to feel good for the player all right narrative September saw the narrative team prepping for a performance capture session. The buildup to this shoot included working closely with the design team to determine a streamlined version of FPS Wildline set. This will allow the various enemy combatants to have enough lines so they can be reactive, but without adding so many uh, as to cause undue stress to the amount of content that would be need to be captured. This shoot also included the return of several established characters for additional pickup lines, pickups based on changes to the location and level flow. There were some additional fun bits that were captured, but unfortunately, they had to be kept under wraps. Narrative team. Narrative also continued working with AI content on dynamic conversation systems for background characters and began figuring out how best to incorporate it into the game. As with the wild lines, Part of the discussion is figuring out a, a way to keep the line set to a manageable level while providing interesting conversations to make the characters in the locations feel alive. Finally, they continued the ongoing syncs with the flight and FPS design teams to review the latest level developments, creating or adjusting scripts to fill in areas that feel too empty or require additional content to explain the gameplay. There we go. Uh, they're starting to use the systems they already have in place. They have an entire mocap studio, which is going to be up and running, if not already up and running by the time they were, they'd written this. So I'm, I'm not surprised they brought in uh, probably several key actors. The reason why they're not talking about it is they don't want to talk about who, uh, because it would, might throw off some, like give an idea of how much they're cha they've changed in some of these, these uh, things. And let me nail this down as well. There are likely entire sections of this game, which will change from now until release. I'm going to reiterate that there are likely entire sections, possibly entire story arcs, which are going to be completely changed or removed before this game is released. That's just the nature of game development. It happens all the time and just what it is. And sometimes they'll add more stuff because they just need they need to have an interstitial like uh, like, like a connecting bridge between two story arcs, whatever. That's what they they'll, they'll, what they need to do. They'll do that. So. One of the reasons why it's difficult to pin down when Squadron 42 is released because they've got to add a lot of, they got to figure out how the game flows as a story and as a game before they can really decide if it's what they need to do, so. Um, so yeah, <laughs> sorry if I leaked, leaked Mark Hamill, but yeah, Mark Hamill, for instance, or John Rice Davies, or uh, all those folks probably came in and redid some lines, redid some positioning, those sorts of stuff, which based off of what the change is. Uh, but they don't want to like let that known because they don't want to uh, have to you know figure that out uh, or they don't have to, to to explain that like oh something changed people lose their minds that kind of thing so all right tech animation 
Uh, September saw tech animation progress with face scanning initiative mentioned in last month's report, which aims to add more heads to the game's gene pool. The initial scan session saw an extra 20 female heads scanned, which are currently being processed by the art teams. Tech animation will then rig and implement the assets into the game. Alongside this, the team explored and refined their methods for implementing geometry caches into the game and Maya's deformation technology. We have some exciting developments with some of our elements in game that will take them to the next level of visual fidelity, tech animation. Tech animation also assisted in the creation and implementation of new enemy types that are being worked on by other feature teams. We've talked about the different things you can do to, um, to AI in terms of their behavior, but you can also make completely different enemy types, like uh, different, you know, shotgun wielders, rocket rocket launchers, but they don't have to be specific. Like they can, they can wear specific uniforms or whatever, so. UI. The UI team undertook a significant code push on the star map and radar to get and many of the separate elements pulled together. As part of this, they added new tech to allow them to create and interact with hollow volumes, which will help with uh, help to get the new version of the radar onto ships. They also fixed any unexpected glitches along the way and improved the visuals. The art team continued to concept various parts of Squadron 42 specific UI. This involved finalizing the look and content of the new MFDs, designing gameplay screens for levels, and completing vehicle style guides. Yo. VFX. Alongside onboarding several new starters, um, alongside onboarding several new starters, I'm guessing like new folks, the VFX team continued to support the art design and cinematic teams with environmental effects and destruction sequences. Finally, work began on a slight overhaul of the particle libraries to make them easier to maintain as the team spreads across the many varied locations. We'll see you next month in transmission. All right, so what did we learn today, Jared? <laughs> what? So what, what was up this month? All right, so we've got uh, more work done on the star map, more work done on the uh, radar, UI stuff. Uh, we also see more customization. We're seeing uh, additional wild lines and redos of some character shoots, uh, dynamic conversations, syncing with flight and FPS teams. So you can see some uh, where you go from social to flight to FPS or from FPS to social to flight or flight to FPS to to social, to flight, to you know, those sorts of transitions between different aspects of the game. Uh, much more level design, a push to get everything done. Uh, FPS scanning and a crane. <laughs> Cranes. Uh, more wild lines, uh, mess hall stuff, food. Vanduul uh, are brutal in melee. And more kind of being able to target, uh, AI being able to target vessels or vehicles while on foot and AI and vehicles being able to target on foot players and other, other characters. So a lot of work is being done on some more AI stuff, uh, some more behavioral stuff and slight polishes on, on certain aspects of the game. So very, very interesting additions. Now, as always, I want to hear your thoughts on this monthly report down below. Maybe you want to talk about the, the two years thing that's been floating around. Um, just keep the conversation going. What do you, do you, did you like this? Do you, do you find these useful and helpful? Uh, let me know in the comments below. And as always, remember, as I always say, hope to see you someday in the black.